today's day is April 26, 2024. We are in LaGrange, Georgia at the Cochran Gallery. My name is Alexandra Nelson. I am a junior art history major and a Spanish and curatorial studies minor from Cincinnati, Ohio, attending Spelman College. I am currently an intern for the Michael C. Carlos Museum, a curatorial intern um, where I'm working on a large collection of African-American works on paper from the Cochran Collection. Today, I will be conducting an oral history interview with Wes and Missy Cochran, who are the owners of the Cochran Collection. Okay, I'm Wes Cochran, um, and we are here at our art gallery in LaGrange. And I'm Missy Cochran. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so what is your all's background? Well, uh, Missy and I both were born and raised in LaGrange, and Missy went to LaGrange College, <clears throat> and I went to West Georgia College in Carrollton, Georgia. So um, we've been here a long time. Our families have been here a long time in LaGrange, so. And do you have anything you wanna? Well, no, it's just Wesley was a stonemason for 30, 40 years, uh -huh. and I was a high school math teacher in our careers. Okay. Can, so, you, can you tell me more about that, like your previous careers before you started collecting? Um, yeah, actually, um, you know, I can remember things as if it happened yesterday. Uh, and yet it's been 50 years ago uh, that it all got started. And actually, uh, I got started collecting art uh, right out of college. I got I graduated in 1974. And so that's pretty close to when it all started uh, happening for us. So. Okay. Um, okay, so you how old were you all when you bought the, when you bought your first piece of art? And can you also tell me about the origins of your collection and what really was the catalyst to get, get you guys started? I know. Wow. Well, Missy, you want to? Well, Wesley is the one that started the collection. Mm -hmm. He went out west and spent time with his uncle and his uncle was an art collector and mm -hmm. um, broker for other people, putting people's collections together, mm -hmm. and told Wes he needed to go make some money and buy some art, mm -hmm. so he did. <laughs> that was way before I knew him. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were a few years pre-Missy. Uh, uh, Missy and I met in 1981 and got married in 1985. But before that, yeah, it's, uh, it's, we had to talk about my uncle. His name was William L. May. And he was born here in LaGrange in 1913. And he was a character, uh, an unforgettable character. Uh, he used to go around saying uh, he was born between the Civil War and World War I, which he was. But when someone's standing in front of you and says that, you're like, wow. This guy's ancient. Uh, but he talked like that. But yeah, I got out of school in 74 and with a political science degree, which is, was pretty lightweight at that time. And I didn't have a clue what I was, uh, was going to do. But anyway, I wrote my uncle a little two-page letter. Uh, he was living in, he had retired to Colorado and li was living in Evergreen, Colorado at that time, uh, like 9,000 feet up on the edge of a cliff. And so I wrote him a little letter uh, saying I didn't have a clue what I was going to do, but I, I liked the idea of traveling. So uh, like within a couple of weeks, he sent me back a 14-page single-space typed letter. Because <laughs> uh, he was a great writer, and uh, he was just writing about the 
beautiful landscape in Colorado and where he lived. And it was just fascinating to me. And I remember showing that letter to a couple of my college friends and uh, they like, wow, man, we, we need to call this guy, you know? So they called my uncle up in Colorado and talked to him because they were so mesmerized by his letter. And I was too. But uh, in there, I mean, he invited me to come to Colorado and, and uh, come out for a while. So I did. I drove out there and uh, spent six, seven months with him, one long, cold winter in 74, 75. And it was fantastic. Um, My uncle was a big talker. And um, it was always very interesting to me. And so he and I sat there for that time I was there. And uh, there's no TV, beautiful fireplace that we'd build fires and he would talk and tell me about all these great sea stories of him and my aunt, his wife, and they're some 25 years of collecting and being in the art as an art patron and a collector. And um, he was just saying how wonderful a life this had been and that I should uh, try to go out somewhere and make some money and uh, invest in art. His advice to me was, uh, it was interesting, I thought my uncle was the president president of a business college in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, during his prime years for, I don't know, 15 or so years, I think. So, you know, he was producing rats for the rat race, you know. But when I came along, his advice to me was to break all your pens and pencils and go out and learn a trade, uh, which suited me fine. And so somehow at about that time, a long story, but anyway, I got a job on an offshore drilling rig in the Persian Gulf uh, as a roughneck. And that's where you could make some money uh, if you could survive it. So I didn't have a clue what that was about, but I think this outfit was desperate for help. So they hired me, and all of a sudden I was in Bahrain working on an offshore drilling rig. And so there was money to be made, and it was tax-free money. So at that moment, my uncle, who was, I have a suitcase full of letters that he would writing me through the years. And he started writing me letters saying, send me the money. I'm going to buy you some art. Uh, My uncle, after retiring from Louisiana and moving to Colorado, uh, he became an art broker and helping people put collections together. Uh, My uncle was I was just so fortunate to have an in-family art advisor uh, to get jump-started. And really and truly, he knew as much about prints as probably anyone in this country at the time. It was, he and his wife had put together a private collection of 1,200 pieces of old master prints. So his collection could show 500 years of printmaking from Rembrandt to Picasso. So he had dug in and done his homework, and uh, he knew it. And so um, I come along, and it wasn't difficult for my uncle to transition from old masters to Liechtenstein or Warhol, which is what he was selling a lot of this contemporary art at that time. So. Uh, and luckily for me, my uncle also trained me how to build a library. You have to read, 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 get yourself, you know, educated. Because I missed it in college. I didn't get Art 101 and, uh, when I was in college. I've gone back and audited courses in art history and all. But 
Um, so I'm 8,000 miles away and sending money back yeah. to my uncle. And so it was actually two years I spent in Arabia. It, so it was two years before I ever got back here to see the art. And he had probably bought, I think during that time, 12, 15 pieces of art, you know? So, um, and I was able to travel when I was overseas some on days off. And he was coaching me of when I would go traveling to visit, you know, museums and try to get exposed. And, and I was reading some at that time. So I came back to the States in 1978 to see the art for the first time. And so I was, uh, really didn't know what I was looking at at the time. I think some of those early pieces, uh, if I remember, were like we had a Calder, uh, I think a Man Ray. My uncle, like I say, those were the early years of our collecting and it was mainly, uh, very contemporary art, Rauschenberg, um, some of those early pieces. And so um, I, he infected me with this disease of collecting. So all of a sudden the fever is going. And so I'm now back here and uh, I, you know, we, I had a pocket full of money at that time. I'd saved money uh, when I got back. And anyway, it, about that moment uh, is when I started laying stone with a good friend of mine that I grew up with here who was a master stonemason. And I was very interested in that. I mean, I'd been out in Colorado with my uncle and they don't call it the Rocky Mountains for nothing. Their rocks are everywhere. And I was always admiring these rocks. And I was even getting books on how to lay rock. For some reason, that was in my head. So of all things, I get back here to LaGrange and discover my friend has started a stonemason business. So anyway, I got hooked up with him and that lasted 35 years of uh, laying stone. So then Missy and I meet in 1981 and then we get married in 1985 and luckily for me Missy uh, met my uncle William L. May and if you had met him you would come under his influence uh, and Missy all of a sudden buying a piece of two art <laughs> directly from my uncle. He could get anyone to start thinking about art. Um, he just had this charisma and uh, magnetism that people were drawn to him. So, um, so we're going at it pretty strong, putting these collections together. 19, about 1980, uh, we started collecting Andy Warhol. Uh, my uncle had gotten into the inner circle of the Warhol crowd in New York, and so we were getting these pieces pretty much directly from the factory. We thought it'd be interesting. It was a logical move for us if we were going to be print collectors, which we were, um, to turn toward Andy Warhol. He is a print, he's a silk screen artist. So it was something we were trying to do was showing one artist's contribution to 20th century art. And it was even better because Warhol's uh, was very affordable. Uh, he could buy Warhol's all day long for a thousand dollars or sometimes less. Uh, Warhol's philosophy was high volume and low price. A lot of artists like, you know, as I the opposite, let's keep it scarce and keep the price up. That was not his model. I think he was very interested in trying to become a household name. So he was getting his art out into the world. And so we were able to get a body of work of Andy Warhol during this time. 
And so it complemented the other parts of the collection that were a lot of uh, contemporaries or colleagues of Andy Warhol, from Jasper Johns to Rauschenberg, uh, Frank Stella, those things. So that's going along, you know, pretty good. And uh, my uncle, <laughs> this is before I discovered some other things, but he, he trained me to go down to the bank to borrow money, to buy art. These art deals sometimes are coming and they're coming pretty rapidly and you have to make a move pretty quick sometimes or they won't be available. So he's teaching me to go down to the bank uh, and this is 1980, and the interest to borrow money at that time was 18% okay. if you went into a bank. So I could write a chapter or two about the experience of dealing with a small town, southern conservative bank, about uh, wanting to buy Andy Warhols, you know. Uh, it was funny. Because no one had heard of Andy Warhol. He wasn't making the headlines so much at that in this part of the world, anyway. So, but yeah, my uncle was saying, you should never worry about this interest rate. Uh, you just go ahead and pay it, because the way these things are going to escalate, that's not going to matter. So I did. I did that several times, going down to a bank here to see if I could get some money together. It wasn't a lot of, I mean, it might be two or $3,000. Well, it was a lot for me, but uh, I would pay it off as quick as I could and then we'd be going back at it again. Uh, but that was before we discovered the layaway plan. Uh, I found out once we got into New York more that you could buy art, uh, you just don't get the art until you finish paying. But it's interest free. There was no interest in bond. So that was even better. So I've had a layaway plan for over 30 some odd years, probably. I had a, I've had an art payment once a month, I know at one time for 30, 35 years, probably. Uh, never really had a car payment. You know, I never bought a car. You can't do art and do cars. So I never really had an art hook. So when I went to the bank, uh, they knew what I was after when I walked in. Uh, I wasn't looking for a car uh, loan, but anyway. Uh, so that was the way it was in the early days. Can you think of something left out? How did your career as a math teacher, um, how does that play into how you all collect now? Or how, did it have any influence? Well, um, I wouldn't, I mean, Art has so much math in it, yeah. but uh, I, I wouldn't say that it did. Uh -huh. I would. Missy has very good eye. Uh, when you go to these places and you're looking, 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 you know, and there's sometimes there's a lot to look at and sometimes there's not so much to look at. Uh, but yeah, we were always together when we were pretty much when we were making a purchase. And so I did, Missy has a very good eye, I think. So, and my uncle had a very good eye. I've never proclaimed to have uh, a trained eye. I've met only a few people that I know that have a trained eye, I think. And we were very fortunate. And when I did find that person, I really hung on, you know? <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, my uncle had it. Uh, and he had some kind of sixth sense. I don't know how to describe that, but. He just had so much experience, and he was trying to teach me that you should walk through those doors, the galleries and museums, and look, and look, and look, and study and read. And eventually, you know, osmosis will take over. Uh, it'll seep into your pores, I guess, if you do it, enough of it, of looking, looking, looking. So that's how things were going. And in 1987, my uncle dies, which I had a feeling I might outlive him. It was, sometimes I wondered, because this guy lived two or three lives in one life. He was quite, uh, 
if you tried to keep up with him walking somewhere like in New York. Uh, you couldn't do it. No. He could be 30 paces ahead. I'm behind him and Missy's another 30 paces. I'm trying to keep, trying to keep them both in sight. It's very difficult. Because my uncle had lived in New York. He went to Columbia University after the war, after World War II. So in the late 40s, he was there for, I don't know, probably seven or eight years. Uh, so he knew the city like the back of his hand. But walking, you know, walk, you know, he was always teaching me, uh, when you go to New York, you walk with a purpose, you know, right? You don't go looking up at the yeah. buildings or anything. You don't want to be a target. Right. So you're like walking like you really know what you're doing, you know? <laughs> so he sort of introduced us to New York and to several other cities around the country. So... Uh, but yeah, he dies in 1987. So that's when Missy and I knew that uh, that day may come and we were going to have to stand on our own two feet. We had depended on him so heavily because he was a very dominating force. Pretty much he talked, you listened. And that was my claim to fame. I listened to him. and pretty much did everything he said. And so that's how we came about what we had at that moment in 1987 of the body of Andy Warhol's work. I forget what we had, maybe 25 pieces at that time. And then we had all these other artists of 75 or 80 pieces, which made for nice survey, sort of a collection of uh, you know, there was a proliferation of prints going on in the 70s at the, about the time we started collecting. There were a lot of artists making prints. So is that what got you into collecting prints as opposed to other types of artworks? Well, uh, my uncle... So old, he was a print. Oh, master got prints. It. Okay. So he was always preaching, we're going to do prints. And that's what we did. We luckily... Uh, Stayed the course after my uncle died and really focused on prints. And that's what our forte is, is, is uh, works on paper. So it was through him. That, and, it, and works on paper uh, makes it much more approachable and affordable for a collector to have this original art. Uh, and so we're operating on a small budget when we were putting these collections together. So when my uncle dies, we think we have it, right? We have the complete package. We have 75 white guys, two women artists. We had a Nelson and a Frankenthaler. And we had a Jacob Lawrence and a Romare Beard. So we had two black artists, two women artists, and 75, 80 white artists. And that's what you were going to have if you're shopping in that mainstream gallery system at that time, which is where my uncle's connections were. He didn't have the connections in the African-American world. Um, so, actually, Missy and I did, and my uncle and I had talked about it. He, he just didn't have the connections. If he had lived longer, we, we may have worked together on this, turning our attention toward African-American art. So that is when we did decide to uh, look, you know, we stepped back and looked at the collection and it looked very funny, very strange. Uh, I had a museum curator once tell me, uh, she was at a big museum and uh, we were talking about this, and she said, you know, that's what you and Missy did. You actually stopped and looked. We never did at the museum. We just kept collecting it, right? We never stopped, really. So luckily we did, and like I say, as fate would have it, my uncle dies late 1987, and within a, you know, six months or so, Atlanta has their first black arts festival 
in 1988. And so uh, Missy and I hear about that, and we decided to go up to Atlanta to check it out. Here we are now on our own, you know, it's very, uh, it's overwhelming. overwhelming yeah, I was just moment. about to ask, like, how did that, it was the five um, black women artist exhibition, correct? At the Atlanta College of Art Gallery? That's right. Okay, and so how did that influence your collection? What was your experience like there? Who did you meet and, yeah, how did it influence you? Yeah, no, that was a, that was a, a moment. Uh, that little did we know, going to Atlanta and going to that show of five black women at Atlanta College of Art. And looking back, that was a very powerful show. So the five artists were Camille Billups, Howard Dina Pendell, Lois Maylou Jones, Margot Humphrey, and Faith Ringo. So they had this beautiful show, and all five of the artists were there, had come to Atlanta. And so we went to the opening of the show, a lot of people. And um, so we, we somehow got to Howard Dina. Uh, it was going to be difficult to get to Camille at that moment, because for one thing, she was so intimidating looking to me with a big black hat and all this crazy jewelry and makeup on her eyes. Uh, and she had a crowd of people around her. She was pretty popular. And, but we did get to Howard Dina and got her cornered up and said something like, we would be very interested in collecting African-American art, what we'd like to do. And she said, well, look, if you're serious about doing this, you need to call this number. And she gave us Camille Billups' phone number in New York. So, uh, and we met Miss Jones in Atlanta. We got to talk to her and, and actually made an appointment to go see her at her house in Washington, D.C. So now, in the early days, I pretty much stayed here and worked on the rock pile. My uncle would call and say, hey, send the money. I got some, right? Now, that my uncle's no longer here. Missy and I are having to do a lot of the legwork and having to move around. So within a week or two, we were in New York, and I had Camille's number, and we called her. Cole called her, and she answered the phone. And Camille is another character and a big talker. And I like to talk, but uh, so we talked on the phone. When I called her in for a little bit, and finally I remember her saying, uh, are you white or black? And I said, well, I'm white. And she said, well, come on down here anyway. So we go down to the corner of Broadway and Broome in Soho, where her beautiful space was. And while we spent, I don't know, three or four hours in the loft with her, looking at her collection. She had a fabulous art collection. And looking at some of her work. But, uh, she, and it was interesting. Uh, <laughs> walking into the space and meeting her and her husband, Jim Hatch, who we became, that was the beginning of a 30 year some odd relationship. We became very close. And I thought when I first met Camille, I thought my uncle had been reincarnated. I don't know what the world would have been like if those two had ever met. It would have been interesting. Uh, she was as flamboyant as he was, and just as big a character. And she did the exact same thing that he would have done, probably, when we first met with Camille. She told us, she said, you don't know anything. So when we left the loft that day, we left Missy and I with two armful of books. She said, you're gonna have to read 
and research and get yourself educated, you know. Before, so we didn't buy any art that day, which I was so thankful for. So we did. We came back home and we read all the books, as many books as we could. And there wasn't a lot of books being published at that time on black art. Uh, but she had this beautiful library and archive in New York. So she was so generous to let us have these books to read. And so that's how we, 1988, that's how we really got started collecting African-American art. And it's been our focus ever since then. Every decision to buy a piece of art has been something to do with African-American. Since then, so um, Camille was always, um, she was quite the entrepreneur. She was always having a sale. She would have a sale. It'd be like a house party at her loft. A lot of alcohol and food, but everything was $500 or less. That was the sort of clientele that Camille had going, that helping people buy art or put art together. So we always went to those sales and uh, usually found some good deals and bought some art. So Camille is really the curator of our African-American collection. She was giving us advice, coaching us, uh, sitting down, writing phone numbers and addresses down and like call these people. Uh, everybody wants to sell. So we knocked on a lot of doors and studios in New York. Uh, a lot of Camille's friends. Because there was no gallery system. There was no museum system. The artists sort of had their own web before the web in New York and had their own networking and they supported each other. And so that's how we started uh, getting these things. And, okay. and then you briefly touched on this um, in your last answer, but you all were friends with a lot of the artists within your collection. So um, how did it pr impact your perspective on art and collecting and just how did it impact you as a person? That's our, for me, that's our biggest reward was being able to meet the artists. And it was funny when we first started uh, going around knocking on doors, uh, Camille uh, said people calling her going, who are these? two white people coming up here and uh, buying art from LaGrange, Georgia, you know, a little small town. So I think a lot of times the curiosity sometimes opened the doors. And then the word got around, you know, that the check is not bouncing. Uh, so that helped. But what was interesting, I thought, as we got into it and meeting people like, we became good friends with Jack Whitten would go to his studio, uh, Joe Overstreet over in the East Village with Corrine Jennings. Uh, we became pretty good pals with Emma Amos who lived just around the corner from Camille on Bond Street. And we'd go to her studio. But, and Bob Blackburn, of course, was one of the first people that Camille introduced us to who had the tremendous printmaking workshop downtown. But uh, a lot of these artists, when we got to them, I realized they were from the South. Uh, I had a Southern connection. So it seemed like we just uh, were welcome or whatever. I don't know how to describe it. It was really interesting how everyone from my memory sort of took us under their wing, you know? and thought, I think, that we were very serious and sincere. It's not like we were going up to New York and get a bunch of art and come back down here and sell it, you know? So I think everyone appreciated what we were doing. But yeah, that Southern, that great migration has happened where if they were not from the South, their parents were probably. That, there's a lot first removed maybe from the Camille's parents were from South Carolina, and they moved out to Los Angeles. They went westward. 
So Camille was raised in Los Angeles. And she said her mother told her that if you ever hear the Southern accent, you run like hell. Yeah, go away from that. Of course, Camille, I'm sure, was a rebel. She never paid attention. So I don't know. Camille, I don't think, knew too many Southern people until we met, I have a feeling. And we got Camille down here to LaGrange on several occasions. Uh, when she'd come to Atlanta doing a film festival or whatever, we'd usually kidnap her and bring her to LaGrange. And she had some funny stories about coming to LaGrange for the first time. I wish you could hear what she thought. Well, she told me once, she said for her to come to LaGrange, she, she like had to prepare herself as if she was going to Morocco. It was that bizarre. Uh, and here she is coming. We got her. I went up one time with Missy's father. And he and I, I'm driving. He's in the front seat. Camille's in the back. And here's this black lady driving around with two white guys in the south. That was some myth that she had heard that should not happen. You know, she very became sort of apprehensive about it. But she was a pretty adventuresome lady. Uh, she had traveled all over the world uh, and lived in a lot of places around the world. So, no, she came and uh, met a lot of our friends here. Uh, they're not art friends. Uh, they're not art people. But uh, anyway, Camille was just uh, enjoyed it, I think, very much. She came several times and, and stayed with us. So, Missy, um, you, also, you, you both had relationships with the artists, obviously. Um, and there's one artwork in your collection called Little Bird by Leon Hicks. And on the back is inscribed, Missy Cochran, your appreciation of art, loving life, seeing beauty, feeling connected completes me. And yes, your passion, the horses, you go, go Miss, M Mrs. Missy, Leon Hicks, 2012. So can you tell me more about your relationship with this artist and also what does this inscription mean to you? Yeah, well, it's very special. Uh, Leon found us. Mm -hmm. We had a mutual friend that sent him this way and he had, um, I guess, retired from, where was he? In the Midwest? He was in St. Louis, I think. And so he basically had packed up his office and all his artwork and was traveling around the southeast trying to place, you know, art in specific places where it would be taken care of. And so he found us and he was gracious enough and he, he uh, gave us all his engravings from mm -hmm. a certain period. So uh, it was great having him here. We had a little show here at the gallery his work and he worked with students at the college. Mm -hmm. It was a, a nice little exhibit. So he's down in Florida now. I think he's in Tallahassee. Yeah. He's probably 87 now, I think. He's never, when we saw him, he didn't have the greatest of health. He's a diabetic. And, uh, but what an interesting guy. Yeah, he came here once, a friend of ours, probably was our friend Carter Q in uh, North Carolina who knows everybody. Uh, he, uh, Leon was, he did go to Fisk and, and, and left them a body of work. Leon didn't have any family and <clears throat> I guess he was worried about what to do with the art. So he was smart. He, he was taking it around. And he came here and we met and, and had a good time and then he went away. And then he called back after he had left and said, look, uh, you and Missy hit five home runs with me, is the way he talked. It was funny. And he said, I want to come back and I would like to give you my 20 years of engravings that he'd worked on from 78 to 98. And so he did. And... Uh, I just thought they were fantastic pieces. Uh, uh, Leon studied at the University of Iowa with a guy named Mauricio Lazansky. He was a very famous 
printmaker from Argentina, I think. But he took Grant Wood's place at Iowa, I think. So this was back in the early 50s when Leon was there. So he had all this great training. And then I think Leon leaves there and gets his other degree from Stanford in California. And he ends up at Webster University in St. Louis for his prime years teaching. And so after retiring, uh, that's when he started, I think he had produced a lot of work. So yeah, we have this beautiful body of Leon Hicks's that uh, he wanted us to have. And so we still have it all. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, you all have been operating as a museum or an institution for so long, lending your collection out to various spaces and curating shows within your own gallery. So you guys are wearing all of the hats that make a museum function, but it's just the two of you. So how do you, how do, you do it? I know, I guess you need to be young. Uh, we had that going at one time. Uh, uh, it was, I don't know, when you're so passionate about it, uh, it really came easy, you know? Um, we started moving the art around in 1985. So I was a truck driver and delivery boy uh, trying to save money for the museums and this transportation cost. So um, that was our first collection of 20th century art. We started moving in 1985. But uh, so that was quite fantastic. You know, I got to drive around. I got to see the countryside and got to meet a lot of curators and artists at these different places. It was fantastic. It was another rewarding experience. Um, and of course, I'm supposedly working on the stonework, you know. If I don't work, I don't get paid. So it was the way it worked. And so I'm losing time by moving this art around. Uh, so I would drive and turn around and come right back, you know. I mean, and some of these, I mean, I drove to Springfield, Missouri in straight. Because also the van or whatever I got, the time is clicking on it because I'm renting a van to haul the art. And I'm missing work. So I'm, uh, people would ask me about, hey, I, I'll go with you, you know, on these trips. Well, they only went one time because it was not an enjoyable thing. Missy probably only went once or twice. You didn't. Are you kidding me? How many times did you go? Oh, too many. <laughs> I didn't think you, I know you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like going? Oh, I didn't like sleeping on the side of the road with yeah. the ark because you couldn't leave the ark. Yeah. And so Wesley would leave just enough room or there was just enough room in the back of the van left. Uh -huh. Where he could lay down and I could shut him in there. Uh -huh. And he could power nap for 20, 30 minutes uh -huh. and then get up and keep right on going. Because we would leave like at 3 o'clock in the morning. Wow. And then we would see the sunrise. And then we would get to the museum and unpack the crates and get right back in the van. Wow. And head all the way home and get back into the water. Yeah, it was not many people would come back with me. Um, I don't know, I could get that 30 minute nap and it's like I got eight hours, you know? And I don't know, I could drive. And you know, if you drive like that, it's still dangerous, really, uh, if you get sleepy. But if you can just keep going a little more, you'll break through to the other side and you could drive to California. And I, I never had any medicine or anything either, uh, but it was fun. I, luckily, uh, we had didn't have any accidents or anything. But yeah, I was always trying to get it there and get it back and get this van turned back in. But we had built all the wooden crates and boxes for the art to travel. And a lot of times I would, I worked a lot of times out of town 
45 minutes or so away. And I would try to get back home in time before five o'clock so I could call a few museums to see about booking the show. Uh, so it was before cell phone. Uh, didn't have cell phones at that time. So it was, uh, I get look back, I guess it was a lot of work, but I didn't really think about it that way. We had a large time doing that. And how do you all operate now? I know that uh, when we went in the back a few weeks ago, Missy had like the, the notes like written with all the crates um, and you were kind of like the record keeper. And so how do you guys divvy up your responsibilities now and how does that play into how your collection continues to exist and flourish? Well, if it has to do with the computer, I... Okay. <laughs> if it has to do with something like organizational, Missy does. I, I'm not good at that. Uh, but yeah, we, we seem to share the duties, you know, that go with it. Um, and I guess we've done it so long. Um, but um, yeah, I don't really promote the collections much anymore, moving it and traveling it. We've done it enough to where uh, we have a track record or a network out there and people will call us. I've had several calls here the last week or so of uh, places interested in some of the collections, you know. So it sort of goes like that. I, we don't advertise, I don't try to promote it whatsoever. I think it's probably done enough traveling. It's been moving around enough. So it was a nice, I mean, we charged a rental fee, you know, for the 60 day tour or whatever of the collection at a museum. And I never really charged properly. Uh, I do now if they want it, I'm going to charge them. But those early days, I mean, I looked, I was trying to keep up with it and it was several thousand in the red. Uh, when I first got going out, I, I wasn't charging hardly anything for the show. So I realized all this move, renting vans and gas and all that kind of business, I had to go up on the price. Uh, and so it did generate a income. And basically we just put it all back in the marketplace and, and was able to help us buy more art uh, by renting the collections out. So that worked out pretty good. In one of your previous answers, you spoke about the connection of the South and how that played a role in the relationships um, within the artists. And your collection has traveled, um, as you just mentioned, it's traveled nationwide, but you've always emphasized the importance of it being exhibited in the South. The, what is the impact of bringing your collection to these cultural institutions, community centers, and small museums across the Southeast? And how, is, how important is it for you all that your collection remains in the South? And what is the mission of your collection? Yeah, it's, it's really nice that it is gonna stay here in the South. And that's what I think in the beginning, as we talked about traveling the collection, I was trying to map it out. I was trying to stay within a 500 mile radius of LaGrange. And so we did cover a lot in the South too. And we really enjoyed going to smaller museums and not going to some regional or big museum. Uh, they have a lot of this art, probably. So it was very fun, a lot of fun going to these smaller places uh, like Moultrie. Or went to Dalton one time. Uh, and you get this great reception. People are very enthused about having the collection there. So it was fantastic. Um, so that's what we really enjoyed doing. But yeah, it's nice that it's going to remain in the, this part of the world. Yeah, and what is, do you all have a mission for your collection? Um, well, uh, we have been working on that okay. for several years. And, uh, and have, you know, we don't have any children. So there's no one in the family I've run across that has shown very much interest in this. So 
that was our dilemma of trying to find a home was the art. And we have had conversations around the country for the last three or four years or more, uh, talking to museums, trying to see if we could work something out. And I think we have worked something out with the Carlos Museum at Emory for our African-American collection. So it, uh, we're very happy that this may, is coming to pass. Yeah, that's lovely. And then my last question for you is, what is your philosophy in regarding expanding your collection? And do you all intend to keep collecting? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, it'll, it'll never end, you know. And so um, we will, we'll keep collecting pretty much African-American, uh, just trying to add to and make it more comprehensive. There's still artists on the wish list that we didn't get to or haven't gotten to yet, uh, I think would be, uh, would help make the collection even stronger. So we still have a lot of connections in the art world uh, of buying it. So I think we'll continue buying. We're sitting in LaGrange Square. Your gallery is next door to a valet and also an antique store. Why did you all decide to open up a gallery space? And also, what show do you all have up now? Let's see, you want to answer that? Well, uh, this family, this building has been in my family for oh. a number of years, uh -huh. since the turn of the century, 1900. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were landlords since 85, mm -hmm. we took over the building. And so uh, renters come and go, and you have to clean up after the renters every time they come and go. Uh -huh. And so <laughs> the art collections had been away, like three of the four collections had been on the road, and they all came home at the same time. Our renter at the time had left the building, and so we said, let's clean it one last time, paint it one last time, and let's Let's just do our own thing. So we are using it as an exhibition space, sometimes for our personal collection, but most of the time we have visiting shows okay. that come in and out. And it was, I think, in the very beginning, uh, we were really thinking of collaborating with the local museum, which is just around the corner. So the lady that was the director at that time, back in 07, when we started the gallery, she was helpful in helping us or influencing us to open a gallery. So it did, it worked. Um, and it also generated some space in the back for us to store our uh, collections. So we use this space as sort of a staging area for our traveling collections. They normally come here to pick it up and it comes back here when it comes back home. So it's worked out. Nice to have. And as far as at this moment, this is a show from Georgia State University students. I think it's five women artists that we're showing that uh, actually comes down uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's been here a couple of months. So we have enjoyed having this show. Lovely. Have you all come to love or appreciate a particular medium along your involvement within the arts and along your collection? As far as a favorite sort of medium, of, I mean, it's all about prints. So all of that is nice. Um, do you have a particular favorite medium? This one. Well, uh, I mean, there are certain aspects about each medium that you like. Silk screen lends itself to look more like a painting, I guess. It does, I think. I don't know, I guess I like lithography uh, a lot <clears throat> because we were very close to Bob Blackburn. And Bob was quite the lithographer, or known as a master printmaker. Uh, I think he could do it all, but I think he loved lithography so we have a lot of examples of Bob's work 
that is in that medium. Uh, so, yeah, I always like that. What is your favorite piece in your collection and why? <laughs> it's a great way to, there's a great way to answer that question. My most favorite piece is the last one we bought. So that means they were all my favorite at one time. Uh, but no, there's some I think that <clears throat> we maybe think about uh, more uh, as far as the, the back story or the journey it took to acquire the piece. Sometimes that enters into why we would consider it something, you know, favorite or special. I know when we think about that, which one comes to mind for you, miss? It's hard to say. It is hard to say. If you had to choose a piece to be the face of your collection. I know. Or sometimes I've heard the question, you know, if there's a fire, which one are you oh, going to run into the, <laughs> run in the house and grab that one piece, right? You get to get one piece. What would it be? Uh, <laughs> Well, the one piece for me that I was very proud to be able to get was the William H. Johnson piece that we have. It's a small piece, uh, but <clears throat> I think it's just a masterpiece, you know, personally. So I really uh, have always enjoyed uh, being around that piece. Uh, but yeah, they're all, uh, I could never grow weary of looking at any of these things, you know. What about you, Missy? Do you have a favorite? It's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard. Love Camille's work, Mildred's work, and especially since we were so close to them. It's just hard to, to pick an individual. If you had to choose just one. Just one. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's difficult. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think. Well, what if I gave you two options? Oh, you watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so who's on your wish list to still collect, or what's one artist that you want to add? I know, we never got to this particular artist, and I've never really had an opportunity to get anything by David Hammonds. I'm sure there are things out there that come across you know, on the auction probably. Uh, but we have never got to him, which one day, hopefully, I always ad admired his work. What, do you have anybody that you're, who's on your list, Missy, or? No, Wesley's the one that reads and does the homework. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then Missy will go into it too, but, um, mm, yeah, I know there are others, <clears throat> other artists would be nice to add to the collection. Um, we've added some recently, uh, Stanley Whitney uh, and a Dred Scott, a couple of Dred Scott pieces we recently got. And um, there's an artist in Atlanta named Lawrence Felt. We have gotten several pieces of his in the last year or so. So, um, who were we look, looking at the other day? Um, forget. Um, we got an Allison Saar. Yeah, we got a beautiful Allison Saar recently, another one. Um, so, we keep adding to and uh, keep, you know, trying to stay up to speed with what's going on out there. So, uh, in the art market. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep looking. Well, thank you guys. Wow, we did. They covered it pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> wow. That's a lady, I didn't get to meet her. She's a junior, I think, at Georgia State and is majoring in printmaking. <clears throat> so she's good, I think. There's several of her woodcuts in here. So. I met this lady. Uh -huh. She's I really like this one. she's from Iran, wow. and uh, I think she's already got two degrees in Tehran. Wow. 
but she's coming to Georgia State to get another master's degree. So she's a little older, I think, than this other students that are showing here. But she, she's pretty cool. And this piece so old. <laughs> yeah, he picked it up yesterday. How much are these things we price for? Or do they? Well, we usually just leave it here. Well, I mean, it's coming down tomorrow. Yeah. And my friend was here that bought it, and I said, well, just take it. <laughs> and this is Adrian, uh, one of the students at Georgia State, who's from LaGrange, or lives, her parents live here in LaGrange. And mm -hmm. Adrian is the lady that really curated and put, got, put all this together. So she's really, really cool. And this is some of her work. Mm-hmm. So it's fun, you know, to have the student. Uh, the previous show, I think, was from Columbus State wow. University students. So we had two back-to-back -back shows. And they seem to be very excited, and they sort of curate their own show, okay. and they come and they hang it and uh, see all the details of installing the show. And Anyway, they seem to be excited. Uh, uh, it may not be the first time they've shown, but it may be the first time off campus mm -hmm. for some of these artists, I think. So it's, it's, it's exciting to, when they come in. Uh, probably some of, we still, uh, some of these are wrapped in plastic that had been out traveling and have come back. This is our friend Bob Blackburn. Um, I think it's untitled, but this is a mono print. And uh, so I think we ended up getting about 45, 48 pieces of Bob's in our collection. I always loved Bob's work, his own work. Bob was actually, no, he was considered a holy man in the African-American world. He pretty much sacrificed his whole career for other artists running this printmaking workshop. So, but I always liked his work and he didn't produce a lot of his own work. There's not a lot out there, but Bob is the one that told me to turn me on to Mildred Thompson. He kept telling me to call Mildred. And finally I did, and I'm so glad I did because we became very close friends. Uh, and Bob and Mildred were very close. They respected each other. Uh, this is a piece by Barbara Chase Rivo, who's from Philadelphia, but has spent most of her life between Paris and Rome. She lives in Paris at the moment, uh, right around the Luxembourg Gardens, you know? She looks over that, I think. She has a fabulous place. Um, but I like this piece. Uh, it's reminiscent of her sculpture which she's very famous for, this bronze sculpture, and then she incorporates fiber uh, with the sculpture. And this is a lot of Sanskrit uh, in the background. But yeah, I always like this lady who's so talented. <clears throat> she's quite a poet also. Oh, here's a great piece, I think. <clears throat> This is by Adrian Piper. It's in plastic, so I don't know if you can see it so well, but uh, this is from her Myth Mythic Being series. And uh, anyway, this lady is very political, and she can, I think, sometimes maybe cross dresses, becomes a man, she can look like a man. And uh, anyway, I enjoy reading about her. I've never met her, uh, but she's quite 
she lives in Berlin. She has a PhD in philosophy, I think it is, from Harvard. Mildred interviewed her one time. I think she must have been in Atlanta. <clears throat> and I think Mildred said they, they only talked about philosophy throughout the whole interview. <clears throat> well, here's another piece that's, I think, very interesting. By Atlanta photographer Jim Alexander. And it's just a great piece, I think. We had a beautiful show of Jim's work here at the gallery several years ago. Some big format and a lot of photographs. And this was a homeless guy in Atlanta that Jim was seeing, you know, in his neighborhood. And he uh, finally approached the guy to ask him if he could photograph him. And I, Jim said he asked about the flag and the guy told Jim, he said, look, man, if you can get this flag off my back, I'll be free. Uh, so I thought that was pretty profound. But uh, so that's what this guy wore walking around the streets of Atlanta, this Confederate flag. There is an American flag down here, <coughs> but Jim was able to capture that. And we might as well show Miss Camille Billups. <clears throat> this is a pretty good example, a representational of Camille's work. Um, I think this is, uh, uh, is this the Baghdad series, I think? Uh, but you can see this mirror, you know, and Camille at one time, who Camille is a tremendous ceramist, she uh, did a lot of mirrors, ceramic mirrors. And uh, so she's incorporated that in this piece. Uh, and when you look at Camille's works like this on paper, a lot of times it does remind you of her ceramic work <clears throat> that she would also paint. And sometimes some of her ceramic figures looks like these two faces right here. And I think there is some Chinese writing up here in the right corner. Camille and Jim spent a year in Taiwan uh, one time. So I think that's from when they were in that part of the world. Um, well, yeah, we could get into that, I suppose. This is interesting. Peace. Fred Wilson is a New York artist. Is that okay? <laughs> I think the name of this is uh, We're All in the Gutter, but We're All Looking at the Same Stars. And now sometimes, we were talking about this earlier, uh, you know, it has this Howard Dino Pindale feel, you know. And some people talk about that or notice that in this piece. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, Fred uh, represented us at the Venice Biennale one year, uh, several years ago. So, he's a well-known artist. And we got to meet him one time. What a fabulous man he is. He and the other artists we collect Whitfield Lavelle. They have been together for a long, long time, I think, in New York. Andy, do you want to keep going? Or have we done enough? Oh, um. Or did you want to see one particular? Uh, um, yeah, maybe just a, a little... Of Mildred? 
Oh no. It, I knew Andy would go for that. <laughs> I know I can never grow weary of looking at Mildred. This is a piece of Mildred's called Quaver Series. It's one of five as a suite of five, and that's one. And that was done in Atlanta at Rolling Stone Press with a gentleman named Wayne Klein, who was a, he was a Tamarine master printer. It had this beautiful shop. It was near Georgia Tech. I can't remember exactly where it was, but we would go over there and Mildred and Wayne became very fast friends. <laughs> Wayne had the equipment and all the stuff and that's all Mildred needed us to get over there and, and start working on, uh, mm, a lot of it was lithography. This is lithography. And so that's a pretty good example of Mildred's abstract. Um, and Mildred, uh, we have a lot of prints by Mildred. Um, she really just wanted to do black and white when she did prints. Her paintings are so colorful. And most everything she did was colorful, but when it came to prints, I think she was one of the European tradition of black and white. We have some examples of color that Mildred would do, but she did it kicking and screaming. She was not interested in color. So here's one of, I think it's wave function. I don't have my glasses. Oh, I'm, no, uh, yeah, it is wave function. This is actually, um, an example of vitrograph, which was done on glass. You know, she was invited. She actually went up, I think, with art papers to interview this gentleman named Harvey Littleton, who had a shop in Blue Spruce, North Carolina, I think. Uh, and Harvey Littleton is the granddaddy of all the glass blowers. Anybody that does blows glass uh, has to pay homage to Harvey Littleton. But later in his career, Harvey Littleton set up this printmaking place up in the mountains in North Carolina and would invite artists to come to work. He was trying to rejuvenate this old, old process that you don't see much of. And I think Mildred was going, went up there to interview him for art papers and they met and then he invited her back to come do art. And so this is something that was done at Harvey's Littleton studio. But uh, she, I think she came to our house, Mildred was at our house one time and walking through looking at our other collection that's there at the house and she saw something. She saw this blue color. It was actually in one of the a George Siegel print that we have hanging in the house. And she, I remember she was taking note of that. And not long after that, this piece appeared. And it is that same sort of blue. There's something registered with her at that moment. So, whoops. Uh, this is still the Quaver series. Um, well, here's one from this piece was done in South Africa at a place called the Caversham Press. This British couple had set up a shop in, I think it was Durham is where Mildred went to, if I remember right. And so she spent a couple of weeks over there uh, working on prints, and this is her um, 
get the name of this piece, Missy. What is it? it doesn't have a name, I don't think. But it's from her electromagnetic fields or all of these colliding particles. So we were able to get a few of these pieces from Mildred that she had done in South Africa. So that's where this is coming from. So what else? Is that enough? 